For the two major parties, ballot access is pretty much a given. For others, not so much. This week you did make it onto the ballot in all 50 states in Washington, D.C., which I should mention no third party candidate has done since 1996. For the first time in 30 years, a third candidate has made all 51 ballots. Ballot access is absolutely critical. It's your name on paper so people can see it and vote for it. For the most part, you'll not even be noticed unless you're on the ballot. It's also how a candidate meets the second criteria for getting debate access. So how does one get on the ballot in the United States? It's complicated, but it boils down to signatures, lots of them. It takes help and persistence from supporters, money to pay for organizers, petitioners, and resources to grind out cases in our legal system. Ballot access in the United States is a mess of a process at all levels. The United States is famous for having non-uniform electoral procedures. Because of these restrictive ballot access laws, many races for the Georgia legislature only have one candidate. It'd be funny if it weren't so indicative of the partisanship and inefficiencies many Americans are fed up with in the first place. I want to dissuade someone like myself from doing this. I am competing with Hillary Clinton to be the nominee of the Women's Equality Party of New York. Her name will be on twice on the ballot. Yes, she is allowed to be on twice. This is episode two, your name here. You do have to get past the frustration of how absurd the rules are and just go, I get it, it's crazy, it's absurd, but you just keep going forward. We met up with the bravest of brave souls, independent candidate, Dr. Lynn Kahn. In May 2014, I was having a very sleepless night. I was tossing and turning. I just couldn't sleep. Woke up in the morning and sat up and literally said out loud, I want to be president of the United States. And then I thought, who said that? <laughs> it was like... Lynn has spent 30 years as an organizational psychologist inside federal agencies. If anyone knows how federal agencies operate day to day, and can speak to the ways the executive branch can improve them, it's her. However, ballot access procedure has been a bit of a rude awakening. Once you submit your paperwork to the Federal Elections Commission to be a candidate, that's kind of where the federal piece ends, and it's really the state regulations that determine how you get on the ballot and who gets on the ballot. Every single state has a different process for getting on the ballot. For example, it takes 125,000 or so signatures in Florida to get on the ballot. It takes 5,000 in Ohio. So it just doesn't make any sense. In New Mexico, it would be easier for me to start my own political party in terms of the number of signatures required than collect signatures to get on the ballot as an individual. And that's just the beginning. So then you start looking at exactly what is it that you have to do. What are the rules? Tell me what the rules are. And we read them and we laugh, we cry because they're just insanely complicated to read. And then one of us calls the Board of Elections in that particular state and goes, this is what I think the rules say, just to get a confirmation because, hello, sometimes what's on the website isn't correct. And sometimes there's just a lot of information missing on the website. Democrats or Republicans, they don't even think about it. They absolutely don't even think about what it takes to actually get on the ballot. The fact that the two major parties have an easier time isn't surprising, but sometimes it defies common sense. Take this county board race near St. Louis, for example. A Republican candidate was required to turn in 19 signatures. His independent opponent, 232. When the independent turned in 273, the Republican, through a series of core challenges, got the county to toss out 45 of his opponent's signatures, leaving him too shy of the requirement. Even with 10 times as many signatures as the Republican candidate, the independent was dropped from the ballot. That's not how this is supposed to work. We're supposed to encourage participation from motivated, engaged citizens. It can be, it can be discouraging. This is Tom Yeager, co-chair of the Green Party Ballot Access Committee. In most states, what happens is the Secretary of State checks the signatures on the petitions that you've turned in to make sure that they are registered voters. Generally, it's encouraged for you to turn in like roughly 50% more signatures than the requirement actually is. For example, in Kentucky, you need to turn in 5,000 signatures to get on the ballot for president. Uh, you should turn in about 7,500 to be safe. Signatures get thrown out for clerical errors and various screen outs shrink the pool of eligible citizens. Texas has a strange process called a primary screen out. People who 
sign your petition to get your state party on the ballot cannot have voted in the Democratic or Republican primaries. And it makes it harder because some people who want to sign your petition legally can't. Timelines can make it harder for grassroots efforts to build up momentum. Sometimes you have to get a lot of signatures in a short time period. Like Illinois, for example, we have to get 25,000 signatures in 90 days. In their models, Tom estimates you can count on 10% of your total petitions to be handled by pure volunteers. The rest, you gotta pay for in some way, be it to cover travel costs or hire professional petitioners. Figuring petitions of under 5,000 signatures can be done with pretty much all volunteers. Um, this is looking at the, like, the larger states. I'd say about, that would be close to $2 million, starting from scratch. It's just math and reality. There's also the cost of defending the work that's already been done. The Democratic Party challenges Green Party petitions in some states, and the, uh, the Republican Party challenges Libertarian Constitution parties. Sometimes these challenges are taken to court and can set damaging precedents. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court basically ruled that the loser in a challenge could have the, uh, the winner's uh, legal costs assessed against them. They used that against Ralph Nader in, in 2004, and basically he was uh, told to pay like over $80,000 in court costs to the Democrats who kicked him off the ballot. Until that ruling was overturned in 2012, no Greens or Libertarians attempted a midterm run in Pennsylvania for almost a decade. Also, some offices are just out of reach. No one has succeeded as an independent or third party candidate in getting on the ballot in Georgia for Congress. It's just been the two major parties since the 1940s. All this still begs the question, if there's true support, why can't they rally the base? Even better established parties can struggle in certain states for various reasons. How you doing, ma'am? Are you a New Hampshire voter by any chance? Have a good day. New Hampshire has a relatively low signature requirement, and the Libertarians were in danger to miss the deadline. 3,000 signatures gets five candidates, including Gary Johnson, on the ballot. Libertarian National Headquarters sent Nick Dunbar to oversee the final push to make sure it happened. He put us in touch with their top petitioner, Jeff, on the last day they were gathering signatures. How you doing, sir? Are you a New Hampshire voter by any chance? I am, yes. So I'm just trying to get some candidates on the ballot, and we need several thousand signatures. Uh, you don't have to vote for them or anything like that. We're strictly just trying to get ballot access. And so it's just a signature, print, and then for voters' domicile, it's just the address associated with your voter registration. Yeah, right there. For, and the date's 8 7 16. You can always vote for whoever you want, but we're just trying to get on the ballot. Surprisingly, that's kind of the funny thing, is very few people are familiar with how the system operates in the first place. Generally, people seem responsive to Jeff, so why did National have to get involved? At the turn-in party, we realized, individual elections don't live in isolation. Until a libertarian candidate gets 4% of the vote to be a governor, senator, or president, the state won't even recognize the party, which means they must petition for ballot access every election, including midterms. Lots of people will go, you know, they'll tell us, like, this is crazy that you guys have to go through this every year. Again, yeah, again, yeah, you know, and, like, yep, and they'll be always happy to sign this. Yeah, Good yeah. luck to you guys. We get tons and tons of that. New Hampshire residents can't even register as libertarians until they are recognized. I'm an independent, but I'm more libertarian than anything, yeah. That, plus worrying about ballot access, is a major deterrent for recruiting candidates and organizers. So some of the people who want to be activists, yeah, there, there were they some took a path of going, let's say, running as a Republican, or in some cases, maybe as a Democrat. That was the better inroad. That's a tough cycle. To make the organization stable, you must first perform well in races that require a stable organization. The 2016 race is a chance to break that cycle. So even the people who are like thinking about voting Libertarian but are kind of worried about having throwaway votes or whatever, like that vote still counts because it, it gets you to the 4%. Yes. yes. You need everybody who thinks they're, they're wasting their vote. Yeah. Go right ahead and waste their vote. Yes. Yes. Even if Johnson doesn't win, we can win here in New Hampshire by staving off another cycle of having to do petition get recognized as a party will have ballot status, which will mean that in the next congressional cycle, we don't have to spend time and effort doing this. I have dairy and conquered, but not Dover. Okay, let me cross that off my list so I don't panic. 
The crew of 15 petitioners turned in 6,000 signatures, enabling over 1 million people to see their five candidates on the ballot. I'm definitely proud of it. At the same time, though, I, I still just don't think it should be required. It, it bugs me, that it itches me the wrong way that, that we have to do that and they don't. You know what I mean? 120 miles to the northeast in Maine, fresh off a recent legal win granting temporary party status, the mood was different. I thought this could be like a big libertarian affair, but you got like the whole community. This is a little bit of everyone here. Correct. That's the way it should be. Yeah, I saw I saw one with the Trump badge. Correct. Yeah, and there's a Bernie Sanders supporter here. Yeah, you yeah, know, that too, yeah. it's all good. We all like lobster. We all like beer. And we all like music. The Libertarian Party in Maine has had some peaks and valleys in the last year. We were there for a peak. There's two ways to become an official party in Maine. One was the presidential candidate for the party can achieve five percent of the vote, or we can get. Uh, initially, 5,000 people registered as Libertarians, meaning they take the time, fill out a voter registration card, says, I'm a Libertarian, and submit it to the state. Chris and the party chose to go with the grassroots registration effort. We had submitted 6,492 registrations to the various towns and cities. Almost 2,000 were rejected. So that left us short by the December 1st deadline, 487. We got a lawyer, we went to court. The first ruling was issued May 27th, I believe, saying, uh, nope, you can't have extra time to get those remaining 487, even though there are precedents from eight other states allowing the same thing we were asking. We filed for like a reconsideration, I forget the legal term, and the judge then, it was a misunderstanding, saw what we were talking about, and we were given the chance. They got their window and new party member Dean did his part to push them over the final hurdle. As far as getting out there and doing it, I have a full-time job, I have a wife, I have two children. I just try to think, realistically, I'm not gonna throw these giant events. I'm like, what can I do? Like, I can talk to some people, registration cards. He quickly found the pitch that resonated with Mainers. Give us the opportunity to put someone else there. You can vote for whoever you want, and a lot of people were on board with it. I had very few objections. In fact, I think the biggest objection I ever had was my very own grandmother. We overachieved the amount needed ahead of schedule by about 30%. They were a party. Then something interesting happened. Interest picked up. There's a lot of psychology. Just getting that extra 487, people saw that it could be done, it has been done, and then they came on board. I was getting emails every day. I'm signing up. Great job. I'm signing up. A lot of people came up to me and they said, oh, that's great. What is it all about? So we got 1,000 in about a two-week period where we'd gotten 630 in a six-week period. When people see success like that, it's easier for them to come on board. And it's not a criticism why they didn't before or have afterwards. It doesn't matter. Um, that's the way it is. Human nature is very complex. The key now is maintaining that momentum. It's not easy to commit to something like this. You know, the pay stinks, the benefits don't exist. <laughs> there is no pay. You know, it, it, you're making a commitment. You're kind of setting yourself up to, to be finger pointed at by people who don't approve of it or agree with it. So it's not an easy thing, but people are doing it. Party status is temporary. If they don't get 10,000 registered libertarians to show up on election day, the state wipes their registration database clean of any libertarians, and they got to start all over again. We are official party status for all intents and purposes for now. Uh, I, I'm sure there's a term for it in Latin, but it's temporary because we have to meet the next hurdle, which is really? <laughs> <laughs> there's no need for ballot access laws to be so complicated. There's just little incentive for lawmakers to change them. Keeping a potential political threat treading water is an effective way to stifle enthusiasm. If there's one redeeming aspect to it, it's that it enables small motivated groups to have a big impact. And individuals like Jeff and Dean can play a role in ensuring millions of Americans can see their candidates on the ballot in November, side by side with major parties. It just needs to be done. You know, it's just like taking the trash out. But those feel good stories come at an expense. Our conversations with candidates and supporters tell a story 
of how these laws drain limited time and resources. After having figured out um, I, my message is good and it resonates, um, I'm just like getting on ballots, getting on ballots. Two week rule this, two week rule that, one memo this, one memo that, you can't do this, you can't do that. When you spend that kind of effort, then you don't have the resources to campaign because you spend it to be able to just get, get at the beginning line, <laughs> just get at the start line. So now you're exhausted. You had to run 10K while well, they're waiting there to get to the start line to begin to run the 10K. When applied in races across the country, this is no small inequality. For minor parties, even a modest showing in a presidential election has a big impact nationwide. Almost half of the states award party status on the next midterm election if the presidential candidate gets 3% of the popular vote. That's a big deal for future state and local level candidates. With so much to gain, why do we consistently see a drop in third party support as election day nears? Simply put, people fear the spoiler. Major campaigns can win back votes by ratcheting up pressure to not vote for a spoiler. While we were in Maine talking with Chris, something else was happening that could have a dramatic impact on the spoiler effect. I'm here on behalf of Fair Vote Maine, educating okay. voters on ranked choice voting. Are you familiar with ranked choice voting? Not really. We decided to look into it more. 